Okay, this is Management of Patients with Complications from Heart Disease. Those are your objectives. So we're going to identify the reason, the patho, and the signs and symptoms. We're going to definitely need to be differentiating between left and right sided heart failure and the management of our patients with heart failure. And how we work with them to manage their new condition. Again, I recommend that you guys take out your um, seriously. I, I don't know that I recommend I continue. I can't even talk. I'm so sad. So you're going to go to your email and print out the concept map that I sent you along with several copies of the medication sheet. If that is working for you and write out your left and right sided heart failure patients and all the things you're going to be doing for them. So heart failure. So this is our primary focus in block one. Um, heart failure systolic. Cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death in the U.S. And heart disease remains a chronic and often progressive condition associated with serious comorbidities such as heart failure. Um, heart failure is a clinical syndrome resulting from structural or functional, sometimes both, cardiac disorders that impair the ability of a ventricle to fill or eject blood. The heart is unable to pump enough blood to meet the body's metabolic demands or needs. The term heart failure indicates myocardial disease. So uh, that's heart disease. Um, in which there's a problem with the contraction of the heart, which is a systolic function, or filling of the heart, which is a diastolic function. And it can also cause pulmonary or systemic congestion. And what I mean by that, congestion is edema. Pulmonary edema or edema in the extremities instead of in the lungs, or sometimes both. Uh, some cases of heart failure can be reversible depending on what is happening to cause the heart failure. Most heart failure, however, is going to be chronic and progressive, and it's managed with lifestyle changes and medication. Okay, the last bullet point is why we have particular steps we take in healthcare to prevent those 30-day readmissions. It's a quality measure that is actually used to indicate how well a hospital or hospital system is doing in terms of managing the patients with heart failure. We need to make sure these patients are discharged on the appropriate medications for heart failure and that um, they have extensive teaching about their illness along with the understanding of follow-up with their providers. So 20% are readmitted within 30 days, and nearly 50% are readmitted within six months. That is sad, but it's because it's a difficult disease to manage, and it causes, or it requires a lot of change on the part of the person who has the heart failure. Um, for example, I know I had a patient that had heart failure, and it was new for them, um, and I asked them, uh, if they had ever heard about taking or drinking pickle juice for muscle cramps. And the girl was like, that is totally what we do. My whole family drinks pickle juice for muscle cramps. Well, she um, had heart failure and she was drinking pickle juice as a type of non-medication solution to having muscle cramps. And guess how much sodium is in pickle juice? It's not, um, it's not sweet pickles, it's dill pickles. I don't know, maybe sweet pickles has a lot too. But you drink that dill pickle juice and it has the sodium and a bunch of other stuff in it. So I had to tell her, you have to read the labels and you have to make sure it doesn't have a lot of sodium 
because that is going to cause you to retain fluids. So just simple conversations sometimes in your, everybody has like a moment where they're like, oh, I didn't know that. So this picture is way too small to be able to see. So hopefully there's something in your book that will coincide with it. But the diagram shows you how um, something happens and over a period of time, it causes some dysfunction. So your body will start to compensate due to low um, cardiac output. And usually it's low blood pressure and decreased kidney perfusion. So you start to have low blood pressure and, and decreased kidney perfusion. Stuff's going to happen to compensate. So our bodies start recognizing there's a problem and our internal alarm goes off, causing our body's internal mechanisms to be activated um, in response to that decompensation. So baroreceptors in the RAS system. These symptoms will compensate for the problems initially, but eventually they fail, causing the body to have the signs and symptoms associated with heart failure. So uh, common signs and symptoms of heart failure, dyspnea, edema, fatigue. Additionally, um, the body's attempt to help itself basically sends it into a spiral downwards. So it can compensate, 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 and then you hit a wall and your heart's like, I'm done. And now you're in heart failure. So I want you to understand that these uh, how they work because the drugs we're going to be taking. Uh, no, I really can't do this. Uh, the drugs we're going to be talking about in this chapter and in Karch, which is your farm book, they're all geared, uh, geared towards blocking the compensatory mechanisms that your body's trying to take. It's a crazy cycle, like everything else when your health takes a turn but the mechanisms are initially helpful. Uh, they cause the heart and body to begin to fail though, and it makes it worse. So as you progress through cardiac, you will want to understand the mechanisms, the drugs we use to treat or block those mechanisms, the patient education, and some nursing diagnoses and outcomes we might find appropriate for these patients. So clinical manifestations of left-sided heart failure. Here's a little cute video of a guy over here and all these little terms I would know. Some of them obviously they're, where'd you know? Restlessness and confusion. So maybe they're unable to hold still and you can only get them to tell you their name. Orthopnea. So that is positional dyspnea. So they're, these are the patients that tell you that they can only sleep when they're sitting up in their recliners. Tachycardia, so your heart is beating faster to compensate for the fact that it's not working appropriately. Exertional dyspnea, so anytime they work out, they're they have they have um. Okay, I'm not going to try to use my own words because I don't have any of my own words left. Uh, exertional dyspnea, they have yeah, I don't have anything. I do, but it's gone. Uh, proximal nocturnal dyspnea. Elevated pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. So elevated pulmonary hypertension basically is what could be happening there. Again, that's not a block one thing. They have a cough, crackles, wheezes, and blood, blood tinge sputum. So left-sided heart failure. I'm just going to tell you right now, left, just think lungs. Left equals lungs. And these are the things you're going to see. Dry, non-productive cough, pulmonary congestion with crackles, and S3 or ventricular gallop. So that's that additional or adventitious sound in the heart when you're listening to the lungs or the heart sounds. Um, dyspnea on exertion, low O2 sats, and oliguria eventually. So they're not um, they're not urinating as much, perhaps. So the left ventricle of the heart, when you have left-sided heart failure, is not pumping enough blood to the body. So the body builds 
the blood builds up in the pulmonary veins, which are the blood vessels that carry blood away from the lungs and towards the heart. So this causes shortness of breath. So if you can picture the heart, you've got that left ventricle, and that's the one I told you has to work really hard, especially as we have heart issues, to pump the blood out to the systemic circulation. So if you're not getting 65% of the blood out every time it contracts, um, then it's backing up into the pulmonary system, if you recall how the blood flows through the heart. So that makes sense that you would see pulmonary symptoms. So the gut, the shortness of breath, coughing. Um, they might have blood tinge, sputum. They might have crackles, extra sounds in the heart, low oxygen um, saturation. So left-sided heart failure occurs when the heart loses its ability to pump blood. So the organs are not getting enough oxygen. The, it can lead to complications that include right-sided heart failure and organ damage. There are two types of left-sided heart failure. I feel like you don't need to know them, but I'll tell you what they are. Systolic. The bottom pumping chamber of your heart, called the left ventricle, is too weak to pump blood out to your body. It's also known as heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. I feel like that is the most common, and it's the one with the most symptoms. Diastolic heart failure. The left ventricle is stiff, and it can't relax appropriately, making it difficult to fill with blood. So this is also known as heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. You will see both when you're out there in the world, if you're working with your adult patients especially. When they do that echo, they may have heart failure with preserved EF, and their EF is still 60 to 65%, but they still are in heart failure and exhibiting symptoms. The two sides of your heart work in different ways to pump the blood. The left side receives oxygen-rich blood from your lungs and delivers it to the rest of the body. That oxygen helps organs, muscles, and other tissues do their jobs. The right side receives oxygen-poor blood from your body and delivers it to your lungs. From there, you release carbon dioxide and take in more oxygen. So what causes left-sided heart failure? Uh, anything that damages the heart, basically. And some of, the, some of it'll just be high blood pressure, stuff that affects preload and afterload. So coronary artery disease, heart attack. So you've got now permanent damage to the muscle of the heart from lack of oxygen. High blood pressure, huge, huge one. Uh, valve disease in the heart. So you have the, all those different valves we talked about when we were going through the blood flow of the heart, atrial, tricuspid, uh, pulmonic, mm, I don't know. Did I say tricuspid? Atria, atrial, mitral, tricuspid, pulmonary, and S horn is located there. And I don't have any more words, so you guys know what that is. Sad, isn't it? Sad, sad, sad. Uh, Abnormal heart rhythms can also cause it. Really, it's anything that's going to disrupt the way the heart um, carries the blood and moves it around. Uh, other risk factors for left-sided heart failure include some chemo treatments because it causes cardiotoxicity, diabetes, and Diabetes is going to damage everything eventually if it's not controlled because if you think about how thick the blood is in the circulation, your heart is having to work super hard, as is your circulatory system in general, to send blood throughout the body. So it's going to affect your heart eventually. Obesity, sleep apnea, I mentioned that earlier, older age, and smoking. Ooh, toxins to your heart, such as certain drugs and energy drinks. I think I told one of you groups in lab that um, we're seeing kids coming in with chest pain, and they're drinking all these monsters and energy drinks and Red Bull and stuff. So watch how much of that you're drinking. 
everything in moderation and don't slam it. Uh, less commonly, certain meds that are used to treat different disease processes like autoimmune diseases and ADD. So uh, think about medications used to treat ADD. Those medications are stimulants. So what do stimulants do? They speed up your heart rate. You speed up your heart rate and keep your resting heart rate high, you wear out your heart faster. Clinical manifestations of right-sided heart failure, the opposite. So the right is going to the body or the extremities. You're going to see it more in evidence when you look at the person in general. They're going to be all puffy and distended. And in right-sided heart failure, the right ventricle is too weak to pump enough blood back to the lungs. So the right-sided, so you have that non-oxygenated blood in the right ventricle that is going through the pulmonary artery as an unoxygenated to the lungs and then it comes back. So as the blood builds up in the veins, fluid gets pushed out into the tissues in the body. The right side of your heart pumps use blood from your body back to your lungs where it refills with oxygen. And in right-sided heart failure, your heart's right ventricle is too weak to pump enough blood to the lungs. So what happens as a result is the blood builds up in your veins. So it's like a traffic jam. The heart's like, nope, I don't have any more room, so you're going to have to wait at this red light. I'm not letting you in. So the blood is building up in your veins vessels and um, all the peripheral tissues, and it starts third spacing out of the vessels eventually. This buildup increases pressures. Um, the pressure builds, uh, pushes fluid out of the veins, which I just said that. It's due to the pressure gradients. So it builds up in your legs, abdomen, and other areas of the body, um, causing swelling. Mostly, I think, we you can see it in all the extremities. You can even see it in people's faces sometimes. But I, use, I feel like it's the most prominent in people's lower extremities. Uh, let's see. So the right-sided heart failure symptoms include shortness of breath still, Distended jugular veins, anorexia, so not anorexia nervosa, but anorexia as in lack of appetite, GI distress, swelling of hands and feet, fluid weight gain, dependent edema, ascites, which is the fluid buildup in the abdomen, fatigue, enlarged spleen and liver, and increased peripheral venous pressure. Treatment focuses on stopping the progression of the disease and improving symptoms. So what causes right-sided heart failure? Well, most right-sided heart failure occurs because of left-sided heart failure. So which one comes first? Left-sided heart failure. It's the most common. Not always, but usually. So the entire heart gradually weakens because it's trying to compensate. Um, And sometimes, let's see, often left-sided heart failure results from another heart condition, such as, I already said this, I'm not going to repeat it again, previous damage, basically. Um, let's see. How does left-sided heart failure cause right-sided heart failure? So if you have advanced left-sided heart failure, uh, you'll have right-sided heart failure eventually when the left ventricle stops working efficiently. The left ventricle pumps less blood out to the body. The reduced blood flow causes blood to back up behind the left ventricle into the left atrium, the lungs, and eventually the right ventricle. The backup causes higher blood pressure, which damages the right side of the heart. The damaged right side stops pumping efficiently and blood builds up in the veins. So as pressure increases in the veins, it pushes blood into surrounding tissues because of the pressure gradient. The fluid buildup causes swelling and congestion throughout the body. And the symptoms I've already told you, I don't know why it's in here twice, all the swelling. You can have chest pain, breathlessness, discomfort, heart palpitations. So if you're standing, the fluid builds up in your legs and feet. If you're lying down, um, it can be in the area of the sacrum or the belly. 
in men, it can be in the uh, testes. Fluid can build up in your liver or your stomach as well, which can cause GI upset like nausea, bloating, and appetite loss. Once right-sided heart failure becomes advanced, you can also lose weight and muscle mass. Healthcare providers call these effects cardiac cachexia. So that's where you have the muscle wasting because you're not eating. Here's some different examples of pitting edema. I'm going to just tell you this. We're going to have some models in class. And the way that I remember how to score pitting edema, when you push it in, it stays in. And the way that you can remember is how to score it one, two, three, or four. Remember, um, two, four, six, eight. And then right next to it, write one, two, three, four. So look at this diagram where you have one plus pitting edema is a slight indentation of two millimeters. So two millimeters is plus one. 4 millimeters is plus 2, 6 is 3, and 8 is 4. So 2, 4, 6, 8 is 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, let's see. No pitting tissues palpate as hard or firm when you don't have the pitting edema. This is just generalized super fluid accumulation. The skin surfaces are shiny, warm, and moist. That's funny that it says warm because I feel like sometimes they're cold, but we'll go with warm. Um, blah, blah, blah. When you look at the different grading for edema, there's also um, time frames. So, you know how I said you can write down two, four, six, eight is one, two, three, four. Um, what goes along with two is that it takes 15 seconds to rebound. So you push the skin in and take your finger off. It takes 15 seconds or less, actually. It says less than 15 seconds to rebound. Grade three is 15 seconds, but less than 60 seconds to rebound. And grade four is between two and three minutes. So that's a very long time. And that those time frames, those are good differentials to know. And here's some different examples of what it looks like. And that's pretty much what it looks like. So a good spot to look at this is in the tibia. Right here. You also can check in the top of the foot. Here's a nice visual of what goes on with heart failure from a pathophysiology perspective. So pause the video and read through it. And this one is systolic dysfunction versus diastolic dysfunction. What causes it? Hopefully this helps my visual people. So the medical management of patients with heart failure can vary according to the severity of their condition their comorbidities, and the cause of it. But treatment usually includes um, oral and IV medications, lifestyle modifications like cutting out sodium and um, fluid restrictions. Uh, surgical interventions could be placing an ICD or even a heart transplant. Um, and supp supplemental oxygen. Comprehensive education and counseling to the patient and family is absolutely needed, and I think that's probably one of the biggest uh, things you're going to need to do. All of these um, diseases that can be chronic, they are life-altering and they require a lot of education and a lot of assessment. As we evidenced a few slides back where we said that 20% of our CHF patients will be back within 30 days of their initial hospitalization. And I forgot what it said for six months, but it was like 80% would be back within six months. So it's hard manage. It's a hard disease to manage. And I remember hearing the statistic that once you've been diagnosed with heart failure, typical life expectancy is around five years. But my stepdad lived like 10 or 12 years with his. But it was also because my mom was a retired nurse and that was her life's work to weigh my dad every day and give him his Lasix and his medications and 
all the things. So I guess if you do a good job of managing it, you can live for a very long time. Um, you can actually lead a pretty active lifestyle if you can manage it. So the lifestyle changes, if you have mild heart failure, quit smoking. All of these are going to be pretty much modifiable risk factors. So quit smoking if you smoke. Work towards a healthy weight, so lose weight. Uh, track your daily fluid intake. You may need a diuretic to help get rid of extra fluid in your body. Eat a heart-healthy diet. So um, lean proteins, vegetables, fruit, low sodium. <clears throat> and in many cases, you may not want to be drinking caffeine as well. Manage stress. Exercise. Get plenty of sleep. Um, follow guidelines for sexual activity for people with heart failure. And there it is. Avoid or limit alcohol and caffeine. Stay on top of your health. So one of the big things I feel like you need to know about heart failure in general is that you want to do a daily weight at the same time wearing the same clothes on the same scale. If you see that you have a two pound weight gain overnight, you need to contact your doctor because that signifies you are retaining fluids and five pounds in a week. So two pounds overnight, five pounds in a week, you are not controlled. You need to contact your provider. Monitor your blood pressure at home. Keep your regular appointments with your provider. Um, get your vaccinations because you're going to have a harder time if you get the flu or COVID <clears throat> or pneumonia. So for severe right-sided heart failure or just severe heart failure in general, I talked about getting um, a defibrillator um, or a pacemaker. There's a bunch of different devices that you can do to help uh, with the heart's, the work of the heart and keeping the rhythm how you want it. And if it's not how you want it, then it can shock you. Uh, we talked about supplemental oxygen as they deteriorate and the comprehensive education and counseling that could be needed. Medications, here we are, there they are. These are not the names of the medications, but these are the majority of what you're going to see. So diuretics will cause the patient to release the fluid via the urinary system when they take it. So it decreases preload and, um, or the, it decreases the body volume of the fluid, which is a preload. With that loss of urine, we need to be monitoring sodium and potassium because they both are going to follow urine in most cases. ACE inhibitors are responsible for vessel dilation, so decreasing blood pressure. Open up the blood vessels, decreases the blood pressure. So as you work to understand the mechanism of action of these drugs, <clears throat> think about what reaction, hormone, and receptor the drugs are blocking. What does ACE do when it's not blocked? Exactly, we don't want the blood pressure to rise with a patient with heart failure. Why do they cause diuresis? Think about it. Again, what normal action are ACEs blocking? Same with ARBs. They are similar to ACEs, but action is blocked at the receptor versus inhibiting the substance. Beta blockers. Um, what's the normal body reaction or receptor the drug is blocking? So there's a hint. Another name you will see is beta adrenergic blocker. What? action do you think the drug is blocking? The right adrenergic, uh, sorry, right, the adrenergic, or uh, now I've got to remember that name again. I can't. SNS, which is the, I don't, I don't know guys, action of the body. <clears throat> I am having it. I just think I'm done. I need to get this done, but I want to be done too. Sensory nervous system, SNS. So beta blockers will block the fight or flight actions. So you have beta cells in the lungs and in the heart. The beta blockers for the heart 
slow down the heart rate and lower the blood pressure. And that is decreasing the afterload. So you're trying to move the blood with the contraction from the heart to the body. That's your afterload. If you slow down the heart rate and lower the blood pressure, it decreases the afterload. You're going to make it so that it's easier for the heart to, um, you're decreasing the resistance in the blood vessels. So it's not as hard for the heart to pump the blood out. And if you slow down the heart rate, then it's not having to pump as many times. So you're giving the heart a break. So it creates an environment that the weakened heart of us, a uh, heart failure patient, will not have to work so hard. Let's see what else we got. Did all that. Okay. Um, I have no idea how to say that medication. I have a Bredine. I'm sure it's totally wrong. Ivabardine decreases the rate of conduction through the SA node. Um, so we're looking for it to decrease the heart rate and the blood pressure. Decreases the rate of conduction. So it slows down the SA node. And the SA node is the automatic or the, it's the pacemaker for the heart. Hydralazine and isosorbide dinitrate. I know how to say that, but I don't know how to say the one above. Um, those are alternatives to ACE inhibitors, and they're to treat blood pressure. Digitalis, or DIG, as it's affectionately referred to, helps to improve contractility. It is its own classification of medications, and um, it's a cardiac glibicide. Whenever you have someone on DIG, you want to monitor for toxicity, especially if the patient has low potassium or hypokalemia. So if I asked you a question about DIG and I said, the doctor has ordered whatever of DIG to give to the patient in heart failure to improve the contractility of the heart. The nurse observes that the patient's potassium is 4.5 and their, their DIG level is 1.2. You need to know, is that DIG level safe to give? Is 4.5 a normal potassium? If you don't know that, you're going to get the questions wrong. So know about your meds. Those are things to know. So hyd hydralazine is a vasodilator, so it's going to open up those vessels. I give it a lot, actually, uh, in the hospital when I was working there. It would be the medication available to give via IV when the CNA would call and say, oh my gosh, this person's blood pressure is 180 over 106. Um, I could look in my PRN orders and see if hydralazine is ordered and then give that. Um, unless I had regular heart blood pressure meds to give and they just needed to be given. But many times it would be after their meds were given and they still needed a little something, something. So we give them a little hydralazine. Then what do you do after you give the med? You go recheck it and see if it helps. We can give it via IV or it's available by mouth, and some people get it scheduled by mouth. Then DIG has a few actions. It's a positive ionotrope, which improves the contractility, and it's a negative chronotrope, which decreases the heart rate, which I already think I said. Um, it can be highly toxic, so our labs that we draw, we ensure we have therapeutic levels. And digoxin and potassium like the same receptors on cells. So we have to ensure there is enough potassium so that um, an equal amount, you know, that we want to make sure we have enough potassium before we start giving the DIG because it's going to fight for those cell receptors. If the patient has low calcium, this can cause the digoxin to take up more receptors than it should, which will lead to too much digoxin and increase the effects. Heart failure is a leading cause of morbidity, hospitalization, and mortality in older adults. Elderly patients who experience heart failure are likely to already have a chronic cardiovascular condition. I mean, that's why they ended up in heart failure, because the heart wasn't working right in the first place. 
but it can also be caused by physical decline due to aging and poor cardiovascular management throughout life. Other risk factors include, I already talked about these risk factors, I feel like, but I'll say them again, obesity, a family history of heart failure, hypertension, and diabetes. Please remember that the elderly may present with atypical signs and symptoms, such as fatigue, weakness, and somnolence, which means they're not really with it, and they may not be able to tell you what's going on or who they are. Decreased renal function can make older patients resistant resistant to diuretics. This is an important thing to know. If you're giving someone a diuretic to manage heart failure, as well as their blood pressure meds and maybe their digoxin, do you think they need to be able to urinate? Uh, yeah, I feel like everyone needs to urinate, but your heart failure patients that are building up fluid in their bodies, uh, they need to urinate. If they can't urinate, they can't take a diuretic and have it work. Diuretics work as long as the kidneys work. So administration of diuretics to older men requires nursing assessment and surveillance for bladder distension caused by urethral obstruction from an enlarged prost prostate gland. So you want to know, are they able to make urine? How are their kidneys working? Because if the kidneys aren't working, diuretics aren't going to be an awesome work for the, it's not going to work either. Um, or if they have an enlarged prostate and they have what's called BPH or benign prostatic hypertrophy, that is where their prostate is so big that the urine can't always go beyond um, the prostate and exit. Uh, we need to be paying really close attention if we're giving a diuretic. All right. So here's our assessment for our patients. Are the therapies effective? So, I mean, I feel like people forget to say that because you just do it and you think it's automatic. But that's part of our assessment. If we give something, we need to see did it work. And how's the patient doing with managing it? Because that's a lot of change that they have to learn. They need to know signs and symptoms. They need to know when to take the med, when to hold the med, when to call the doctor, how to change their diet. They need to weigh themselves every day. Um, they need to not drink sodium, they need to cut down on their water intake, all kinds of things. So they need to be, uh, we need to talk, we need to, we need to educate them, but we also need to be checking for signs and symptoms of worsening heart failure. And then also it's a huge, all of these chronic diseases, and I want you to write this down, chronic disease. If you are diagnosed with a chronic life-limiting or potentially life-limiting illness, you can pretty much know that your patient is probably going to be depressed. So we want to watch for their emotional and psychosocial response. What kind of support system do they have? Um, what are their coping skills and how did they cope in the past with stress? A lot of talking might need to happen. Then what's their health history and their physical exam? What's their mental status? How do their lungs sound? What are their heart sounds? Do they have that extra S3? What's their fluid status? Do they have signs of fluid volume overload? If they have congestive heart failure and they're on IV fluids, what's it running at? And why are they on that? Is it contraindicated? Sometimes it might be. So use your critical thinking skills. Get your daily weight and track your eyes and O's. Strict eyes and O's for these patients. I want to know what they're taking in and what their output is. Why do I want another output? Why do I want another input? I'm trying to control fluid. That's why. And then assess their response, responses to their meds. Are they working? Are they working too well? Are they working just right? Here's some different lung sounds for you to check out. Um, heart failure is a common and complex clinical syndrome that results from any functional or structural heart disorder and an uh, impairing ventricular filling or ejection of blood to the systemic circulation to meet the body's needs. Heart failure can be caused by several different diseases. Most patients with heart failure have symptoms 
due to impaired left ventricular myocardial function. So remember I said left ventricle fails first. Then you have left-sided heart failure. Left equals lungs. Patients usually present with dyspnea, fatigue, decreased exercise tolerance, and blood retention, seen as pulmonary and peripheral edema. There's your risk factors. Coronary artery disease, myocardial infarction, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, smoking, diet, physical inactivity, stress, lack of sleep, bacterial or viral infections, alcohol use disorder, AFib, thyroid diseases, congenital heart disease, and complications include <clears throat> hypotension, poor perfusion, irregular heartbeat, heart valve problems, pulmonary edema, pulmonary hypertension, severe volume overload leading to respiratory distress, and anasarca. Anasarca is generalized to deep you guys, and arrhythmias. So anasarca is like every single thing is swollen about your patient, their face, their cheeks, their neck, their stomach, their arms, their fingers, everything. Cardiogenic shock due to pump failure. Sudden cardiac arrest, CVA, or stroke, aneurysm, peripheral artery disease, thromboembolism, pericardial effusion, kidney damage, liver damage, malnutrition, and death. Uh, I feel like I am reading off a commercial for a med. You know how you list off all the potential side effects? I just needed to say it faster. Here's some uh, nursing diagnoses that you can use to go along with heart failure. And it depends on what your assessment findings are and what your patient's needs are. So pause the video and review these and see if you can think up some more. Use your list if you need to. Here's some goals for your patients with heart failure. Notice how specific they are. SMART goals. And will lose one kilogram of weight within 48 hours. How much is that? That's 2.2 pounds. Is that realistic? Yes, it sure is. Because they're on a diuretic more than likely, so they're going to lose that weight because it's water weight. So SMART is specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. I had to think about that for a minute. Okay, interventions. What can you do? to improve your patients that have activity intolerance. That was the term I was trying to think of five slides back and it would not come to me. Your patients with heart failure all have activity intolerance when they're going through an exacerbation. So, um, bed rest, encourage regular physical activity, build up to about 30 minutes a day, training, exercise training, uh, do clustered care, clustered care. So clustered care means I'm a nurse. I'm going to put a sign on the door that says, please do not enter patient's room or CRN before entering patient's room. So that if um, respiratory is here or the lab, um, they come find me as the nurse and I go in with them and we cluster our care. I'm going to get vitals. I'm going to check the blood sugar. I'm going to bring meds if it's almost time for their meds. I'm going to bring a, you know, I don't know, a new gown, whatever I'm going to bring. But you try to go in when everyone else is instead of everybody going in 50,000 times. We should do that for all of our patients that are in the hospital. But activity intolerance this is the big one. We do cluster care. Oh, and then elevation of the head of the bed to facilitate breathing and rest, support of arms. So we put their arms on pillows. We might even put their legs, um, we might elevate their feet if they have right-sided um, heart failure and they have the um, lower extremity or extremity edema. All right, are we almost done? I don't know. I feel like we should be. 
Here are additional nursing interventions for the PowerPoint mill no, for the patient with heart failure. This was manage fluid volume. These are all the things. These are definitely things that you should know. Assess for symptoms of fluid overload. What are those? You just did them in your um, head to toe assessment. So think about that. What signs and symptoms would demonstrate fluid overload? Get a daily weight. Track their eyes and nose. Give them their diuretic. Um, check their labs when you do that. If it's um, if it's Lasix, you need to know what their potassium is. Fluid volume intake. Do they have a restriction? Make sure it's noted and we're tracking it. Maintenance of sodium restriction. So what's coming in that room and is anybody bringing a McDonald's? Because there's a little salt in there. So thromboembolism. People that have a cardiovascular disorder are at risk for development of this. So that is where they have pain in the calf, swelling, warmth, and redness. And a thromboembolism is a blood clot. So what did I say about day two after surgery? Day two after surgery, if the patient hasn't gotten up, they are at risk for a blood clot. Well, now it's not even surgery. Your patient is has activity intolerance and they're on bed rest for the first 48 hours for whatever reason the doctor said they could be. I don't know why they did, but they did. So they're not moving around or they're not on bed rest, but they're so out of breath that the most they can do is stand up, pivot, and turn around and sit in a chair. Are they at risk for a thromboembolism? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Another, um, let's see, I'm looking to see, does it mention AFib? I don't know, we'll talk about that later. So there's different treatments that we can give to prophylactically avoid getting a blood clot or a thromboembolism. And in the hospital setting, a lot of those patients are on heparin or anoxaparin or Xeralto which this is the generic name for that. I call it Zeralto because I can pronounce that. Uh, Riva Roxaban. Riva Roxaban. Sounds like a rock band. Yeah. Uh, so if you have to put somebody on, this is so long. If you have to put somebody on a blood thinner, you have to put them on bleeding precautions too. Lots of stuff. A lot of things. End of life. When do we want to start looking at palliative or hospice care for people that have comprehensive heart failure? We should probably start early. Remember, you can always get a palliative consult for anyone who has a chronic health condition that is life limiting or that we're not expecting it to get better because there's so many things that we can do to help them manage the symptoms and give them quality of life. Doesn't mean they're dying anytime soon. People think when they hear palliative that it's hospice, it's not the same thing. So it's important to ask your patients that have these types of diseases if they have um, end of life documentation. Do they have a uh, medical power of attorney? Do they have their preferences documented? Do we have a copy of that? What would give you back the, um, what would give you value back in your life? especially if they're depressed. Like, what, what did you used to do? What could we do instead? Um, let's say you have a patient that has had heart failure or other heart issues and they have a pacemaker or a defibrillator or otherwise another device that is keeping that heart beating if they have a heart issue. Make sure that if you are talking to them, maybe they have another thing going on. Maybe they're dying of cancer. Um, you want to talk to them about deactivating the device that's helping their heart beat because I feel like there's not much worse than watching someone who's passed away uh, have their pacemaker shocking them here and there. It's not bringing them back. They're gone. But the family is going to stand there and watch that until somebody deactivates it. So. Um, all things to consider when your patient is on 
hospice or going on hospice end of life and they have a pacemaker or an ICD. Then your code status. When your heart stops beating, should we allow you to die naturally or try to revive you with chest compressions or intubation but if necessary? So, um, and end of life symptomatic management. We'll get into that with hospice. I feel like we've talked enough. It's uh, 50 minutes in. Have a great rest of your day. Maybe you should take a break now too.